Welcome to the second video review for 366 Weird Movies. Reviews scripted and edited by Penguin Pete Turbovich. Narration by Giles Edwards. Here we try to find movies that weren't weird enough to make the list of weirdest movies ever made, but still deserve some consideration from fans of bizarre cinema. This time we're looking at 1968's Boom! When it comes to weird movie endorsement, what could be better than to be a favorite film of John Waters himself? We'll even let him explain some of it. So today I'm trying to show a film that is very, very important to me that really personifies my taste. Uh, this film I show to future dates on my first date. If they don't like it, I can never go out with them again, really. Um, it's the best failed art movie ever. Uh, it's called Boom. It's a ridiculously retitled Tennessee Williams play, The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore. Um, it stars Elizabeth Taylor as Sissy Goforth, the richest woman in the world. It is the ultimate drag queen role. Um, Rupert Everett even did it on the stage in London a few years ago and played the same part. Uh, I can never forgive my parents. It was a play, and it came to Baltimore when I was 12, and it starred then Tallulah Bankhead and Tab Hunter. And my parents didn't take me to see it, which I think is child abuse, basically. <laughs> uh, it, it also stars Richard Burton as the angel of death, who has the <laughs> unfortunate habit of calling on wealthy women the day before The Undertaker. Uh, it was directed by Joseph Losey, uh, a director I like very much, that if I ever had to get a director tattooed on, I think it would be Joseph Losey. And I like his failed art films the best. Uh, failed art films seem to be a genre today that we don't see anymore, because now the independent film in America takes all the screens for all the foreign films that we used to see, so we don't get to see as many failed art films. Um, this film, this is probably the biggest audience this film has ever had. Um, it, it was a huge flop when it first came out. Uh, it just re was released on video for the first time. It's already out of print. It was in print for about five minutes. There used to be only one print of it in the world, and I used to tour with this movie to film festivals and present it. Uh, it was a giant flop when it came out. It, they had it called Boom, and then it didn't work, so they retitled it Boom with an exclamation point, which is the most <laughs> pitiful marketing I ever saw in my life. You know, uh, Joseph Losey bragged that he was the first director to ever lose money with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton with this film. And he talked about in his book how every day on the set, they started off with Bloody Marys. So basically, they all made this film drunk. I think that is one of the reasons. But it, Elizabeth Taylor's performance is staggering in it. I mean, just watch her performance, and it really influenced the Divine and I. We used to watch this all the, the time when we were young. And I finally met Elizabeth Taylor. I went to her house to a cookout, and I think I was invited because her staff, she has an all-gay staff, and uh, they like my work. I think that's why I got invited. So I walked in, and I said to Elizabeth Taylor, oh, I love Boom, and she said, that's a terrible film. She got really angry at me. Boom was a box office flop in 1968, and has since gotten a cult following as a campy insult to cinema. But really, the story is much more complicated than that. One of eleven movies to star the dynamic box office duo of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, this was the first time a Taylor-Burton movie lost money, because Taylor's star was fading fast. Based loosely on a Tennessee Williams play, but this also came from the part of Williams' career where his star was fading fast, too. Are you sensing a pattern here? This movie is so cursed, we're afraid to review it. But let's start with the good news. The visuals are stunning. Filmed on the island of Sardinia in the scenic Mediterranean, the set was a custom-built house designed like the summer home of the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, it's oppressively white and avoids anything approaching a straight line or 90-degree angle. Some shots even managed to evoke M.C. Escher paintings. But for a cultural comparison that's really on the nose, there's the classic Myst computer game series with the second game in that series being Riven. Compare Riven to Boom. Sure, that's the building where you solve the marble puzzle so you can get the clue how to rotate the pentagram room so you can break into Gaines Laboratory. Or we have this contraption, just like that railed shuttle car you take between islands in Riven. Heck, they even chopped up one of the native creatures from Riven Island to serve for dinner. Here's a movie mystery to solve. What is up with these Easter Island statues in the background? 
Nobody seems to notice that ancient stone idols managed to migrate from the South Pacific to Europe. Were these ascent designers joke? Or does Sardinia just erect replicas of famous world landmarks willy-nilly? Seriously, does anybody know the story? Tip us off in the comments. This is keeping us up at night. Next, you have the premise. Liz Taylor is Sissy Goforth, a wealthy five times widow now secluded on her own island. Sissy is slowly dying of some mysterious ailment, and she's pretty peeved about it. She gets two male callers popping by for a visit. Noel Coward is the Witch of Capri, here to read her fortune, and Richard Burton is Chris Flanders, an angel of death in human form who visits the terminally ill to shepherd them into the afterlife. So far, you have a great allegorical setup that has a shot at being next door to the Seventh Seal. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there's Taylor's performance. She plays the most overwrought, bitchy character that would ever grace a screen until Faye Dunaway was past that torch in Mommy Dearest. Mrs. Goforth, you mustn't do this. It's ridiculous of you. This is my island, and you are on my island, all of you. And I reserve the right to do as I please on my island. Moi, du domain. Hurry up, presto! This is not a Christmas stocking. Taylor spends the whole movie cussing out the servants, ordering her staff around like a Banana Republic dictator. Now tell them to bring the table over here so I can put my chair in the shadow when I want it in the shadow. My skin's too delicate to be in the sun for more than half hour into this. In between her temper tantrums, she flings herself onto the furniture for pity party narration of her memoirs. Every word out of her mouth is me, me, and what about me? Her nasty character dominates every scene like a gender-swapped Albert from The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover. After a while, her role is just nails on a chalkboard. in your general direction. You could replace her whole dialogue with... <laughs> and it wouldn't make any difference. Noel Coward sleepwalks in a performance as himself, brought in at the last minute to replace the female that the role was originally written for. Burton deals the best hand, trying to bring a bit of Shakespearean class to the production, but he's damn near drowning in the ham gravy surrounding him. What's worse, his character gets pitched off the boat, shot at, and attacked by vicious guard dogs under the command of a ruthless security guard played by Michael Dunn. Even though the whole plot of the movie revolves around their relationship, Taylor and Burton don't even have their first conversation together until nearly an hour in, after he's been practically held prisoner for no other reason than because Sissy is just that much of a bitch. At some point, we have to mention the booze. Reportedly, everyone on the set of this film got roaring drunk during production, and Sissy Goforth's character is an alcoholic, which is underlined in more scenes of her drinking than the Big Lebowski had white Russians. She grips that cocktail glass like she's sucking the blood out of a bat. Between this and her smoking and pill-popping, it's not hard to guess that her ailment has something to do with her substance abuse. Look at this weird beachside gazebo. They had to stock it with bottles of booze in case she needs a gulp without walking all the way back to the house. We're sure the alcohol made the costumes easier to bear. Liz Taylor wins the Birdcage Award for campiest kabuki getup, and we're sure her head can receive shortwave radio on that thing. She also strips Burton of his clothes and forces him to wear a samurai outfit just for her sadistic amusement. Then she complains later that he has a sword. Oh, he also has a little black book with the names of all the former people he has called upon, now deceased. Taylor reads these names aloud in shock. They're all dead! What are you, some kind of graveyard sexton? 
I'm a man who's lost many friends. Death Note fans, you can make your own jokes here. Despite the high art trappings, this movie doesn't really say anything deep about death. For all we know, there may have been a better point made in the original Tennessee Williams play, The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore, which, boom, is based on, but only references with an orphaned title drop. The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore. The dialogue is insufferable and begging for your smartass ad libs. The sad part is, between Tennessee Williams' declining state by the time you wrote this and the Taylor Burton cinema machine running out of steam by this time, you can sense a better script fighting to claw its way out. Is Boom a weird movie? It could be considered so based on how unique it is. While it is indeed a bad movie, it is also a jaw-dropping spectacle that will hold your stunned attention. The budget, estimated up to 10 million, puts Boom in the ranks of truly misguided flops. We would ask, what is with the stupid name? But after we examine everything else about this movie, the title is just an appendix to the list of bad decisions that went into making Boom. <laughs>